Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this and other Lord's Day. We thank thee for all our manifold blessings to us, all of which are undeserved and all of which come to us solely through the Lord Jesus Christ, who was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be rich. We thank thee for the riches the unsearchable riches in Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank thee that thou hast also given, an under, given us an understanding, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding. There it is. So we might know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal Light. We thank thee that thou hast given us this one day out of the week, separated it unto thyself, separated it unto thy service, and separated it unto the blessing of thy people. So we pray that thou hast blessed us this day, cause us to understand and believe. Lord, increase our faith. And we pray for the gospel as it goes forth, that it will go forth, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. We, so we pray for thy servants, that they would proclaim the truth boldly. We pray that thou wouldst raise up even more men to stand for the truth and against the lie. In the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, we also pray for our country as we have just been reminded once again of the, of the darkness, the darkness that only gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Uh, as we see the appointment of someone who is as far from believing, as, as far from righteousness, as far from morality as the East is from the West, and so many people are, are so um, optimistic. Uh, so we pray that we would continue to be able to live lives of uh, peace and godliness because our uh, the threat to our peace is always present because we know that the world hates uh, what we proclaim more than anything else. So we pray that thou wilt be with us, guide us, enlighten us. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray, amen. We are still looking at Hebrews 11 and in general, specifically at verse 17 where we have gotten to, well, we've returned, have we not? Because we were at Abraham beforehand. Um, in verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And then we have returned, in verse 17, to Abraham in a different sense, uh, not a difference in kind, a difference in degree, a, a difference in emphasis by faith. Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. So we see even in this particular instance, we have the calling of Abraham and we have the development of it. You have to have life before you can have motion. You have to have life before you can have growth. And so we are taught here indirectly, at least, this very thing. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Last week, uh, in dealing with this verse 17, we dealt, it, we dealt with it insofar as uh, the example of Abraham relates to the examples of the other persons in our text, namely, Abel, Enoch and Noah, which is to say that you are, number one, saved through faith, which is what Abel teaches us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Though this is a New Testament declaration, Abel, in principle, understood that the wages of sin is death, as well as any New Testament saint, I say in principle, has ever understood it. Abel's sacrifice told Abel, and he by God's grace believed it, 
that Abel himself deserved death. That animal was, was representation of him. But this was not a physical death, which is clearly indicated by the fact that it was an animal that was sacrificed. What does the death of an animal have to do with a person? Only in so, so far as it was a representation of something other than itself. So it had to be a spiritual revelation to Abel that he himself deserved spiritual death, <clears throat> but the gift of God, the same verse tells us, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> Abel understood this also. He understood the wages of sin is death and the death of the animal. He understood. But, the gift of God is eternal life. That whole sacrifice included the whole thing. The smoke of the burning sacrifice rising upward indicated the fact that God was pleased with his sacrifice. Let's look at Ephesians, which tells it as clearly as I know it can be told. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, <clears throat> which says, Well, let's start with verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Note carefully, because we tend to miss it, that the smoke of the sacrifice could not possibly indicate what all religions other than Christianity always seek to communicate, and that is that God was pleased with Abel because he offered the sacrifice. Nothing could be further from the truth. The killing of the animal itself indicated that God was so not pleased with Abel from birth that, he, that Abel deserved not only death but eternal death. He was so not pleased with Abel. But the smoke of the sacrifice, which Enoch also understood, indicated that he understood, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We quoted last week from uh, um, Micah chapter 6. Will the Lord, Abel understood the answer to this question too, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I get my firstborn? For my, this is the natural realm, right? Carnal thinking. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams since he commanded the animal sacrifices or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I get my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? And the answer is no, which he understood. But we have every reason to believe that the majority of people participating in those sacrifices during the Old Testament and even performing the sacrifices believed that God was pleased. Listen to this. We have every reason to believe that the majority of people participating in the animal sacrifices believed that God was pleased with the sacrifice sing other than the sacrifice rather than the sacrifice. And today, it is exactly the same. God is pleased with our believing and not the object of our faith. See, nothing has changed. Think of that most influential heretic in the history of the church. John Wesley said, God accepts our faith instead of perfect righteousness, which is to say, that God accepts our believing. God is pleased with our believing instead of the object of our faith, anathema. Secondly, this was the example of Enoch. Taught us that the wages of sin is death. Secondly, we get to the example of Enoch, which tells us and which indicates the importance of faith. See, uh, through faith, Abel understood that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And through faith, Enoch understood something else. 
And not only in justification is faith necessary, but also in sanctification. Because death being separation, life, think about this, death being separation. When a person dies, we frequently hear somebody say, we were talking about this yesterday in our devotions, we frequently hear somebody say, he's gone. Death being separation, that's a true statement. The soul left the body, separation, death being separation. Life must be union. And death being rebellion. Life must be obedience. This is the example of Enoch. We said it before and let us say it again. What exactly is it that happens when as Romans 3.20 tells us, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Remember we quoted Job's words, I think it was last week. I have heard of thee by the... I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and in, repent in dust and ashes. Now this is not false modesty. Whenever there is love, there is hatred. Wherefore, I abhor myself. So when hatred is present, love is also present. Keep that in mind. The fact that you love your flowers necessitates that you hate the weeds which seek to choke them out. So what did Job's self-abhorrence tell us about what he loved? Wherefore, I abhor myself. We know the object of his abhorrence was himself. What does it tell us that he loved? When a man really and truly faces the law of God, he sees that in the words of John Chrysostom, that he not only, John Chrysostom said this, man, is, man not only has a sinful nature, but he himself is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, sin. That's why he abhors himself. But you can only abhor yourself objectively. Listen to this, this is a little bit deep. You can only abhor yourself objectively. Because subjectively speaking, we are all born ate up with self-love from the time of our conception. Oh, so when we're saved, God through his law causes us to view ourselves objectively for the first time. And he does this through the objective standard of his law. And get this, the only way that you can abhor yourself and see that you are infinitely in need of a righteousness that you do not have is not only to see and understand the law, but to love the very thing that condemns you. How is that possible? It's impossible. And you can only love the thing that condemns you if you are able. Once again, you can only love the thing that condemns you if you are able to view yourself objectively. The first law of human nature, we're told. What is it? We've heard it a thousand times. The first law of human nature is self-preservation. Which is to say, the first, the, the first law of the natural realm is to love yourself first and at the same time to hate anything and everything which poses a threat to your continued existence. Think about it, right? Self-preservation. Listen to the words of John Calvin. He says, for what man, see if I can find it, for what man in all the world would not gladly remain as he is, what man does not remain as he is, so long as he does not know himself, which is to say, so long as he hasn't seen himself objectively, and no man can see himself objectively. That is, while content with his own gifts, and either ignorant or unmindful of his own misery. Accordingly, Calvin says, the knowledge of ourselves not only arouses us to seek God, but also, as it were, leads us by the hand to find him. Back to Job. I have heard of he, thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and in repent in dust and ashes. 
No. I abhor myself. The subject of the sentence is first person singular. And the object of the sentence, the object of the verb, is first person singular. Now think of just what has to happen for a person to truly say this. I by nature, and this includes all of us, abhor, once again, anything and everything that poses a threat to my continued existence. And so for this statement to be true, a miracle has to have taken place in Job. And we suggest also in Abel. He saw the same thing. But all of us are so ate up with false modesty that it is extremely difficult for us to understand, for, for us to grasp this idea. For example, we've all heard people say in certain circumstances, I hate myself. And the context in which the statement is made always is that the person making the statement has done something that is inconsistent with his own good. You see that? Meaning that whenever we hear a person say, I hate myself, he's really saying, I love myself so much, why do I keep doing these things which are so inconsistent with my self-love? Do you see it? This is similar to what the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament. You see, what we're talking about now is how difficult it is for us to understand and believe that Job really meant this. I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes because we're so ate up with false modesty. The Apostle Paul this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We immediately and subconsciously tend to think that Paul is guilty of false modesty, but he wasn't. No more than Job was guilty of the same because a Calvinist would never say such a thing. I'm the chief of sinners. He's too busy telling us that he's not nearly as bad as Adolf Hitler. And that's the only reason that Hitler constantly comes up in their discussions of total depravity. So for Job to have really meant this, what he said, a miracle had to have taken place in him. Therefore, and that's exactly what we have in Scripture, therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creation. He is able to view himself objectively for the first time. Something that when a person is saved, something that has never existed before comes to pass, becomes reality. And so the new me abhors the old me, which is the only me that has hitherto ever existed. And this is what Abel saw. But be careful not to miss the point. The only way that Abel and Job could have said, I abhor myself, was for him to love something else at the same time. And that was the law of God. Whenever a person hears the proclamation of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, one of only two things happens. He either believes the prohibitions of the law are too stringent and therefore that he cannot keep them and he loves himself and hates the law. I'll say that again. When a, whenever a person hears a proclamation of the Decalogue, only one of two things happens. He either hears the proclamation of the law and sees that this is too stringent and therefore in his love of self-hatred, hates the law. Or, he believes that what the law prohibits is exactly what it should prohibit. And he loves it and hates himself for not being able to keep it by his very nature. And we have just refuted antinomianism. Because though antinomians constantly speak of the imputed righteousness of Christ, they've got southern accents usually, 
You cannot see yourself in need of the righteousness of Christ until you have been caused to love the law and hate yourself for not being able to keep it. Do you see that? But it's inconceivable to the person who's been caused to love the law to turn around immediately and say, I'm saved by grace. I'm not obligated to the law. I don't have to keep the law. Imagine a person who's been caused to love the law and therefore hate himself, see himself in need of the righteousness which God demands and of which he has nothing to turn around and say, I don't have to keep the law. And this is the very thing, the very link that takes us from Abel to Enoch. Let's read the text again in verse 5. Hebrews eleven five 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Do you see it? Think about this. You can please your friend by being his friend when he most needs a friend. As we say in English, a friend in need is a friend indeed. You can please your friend by being a friend when he most needs one. You can please your child by protecting him whenever he's in some kind of danger. But the only way you can please a king is to be a faithful subject. Once again, shorter catechism question number 102. We keep going back to it, don't we? What do you pray for in the second petition? Second petition, which is, Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. We pray that Satan's kingdom, the kingdom of disobedience, may be destroyed and that the kingdom of grace may be advanced, ourselves and others, brought into this kingdom, being subject to the king and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory may be hastened. And so we see the, the logical progression from Abel to Enoch. From saying the same thing about sin, what do we say confession is? It's a compound word meaning say the same thing. The progression from Abel to Enoch. From saying the same thing that God says about sin to saying the same thing that God says about service. That previously you were the servants of Satan and now you are the servants of God. And this is everywhere in Scripture. Notably, in Romans chapter 6 it says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Romans six seventeen. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you were no longer the servants of sin. Ye were of your father the devil. Christ said to the Pharisees, You are your, of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. You were the servants of the devil. And then back to Romans 6. Paul says after verse 17, in verse 20 he says, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Verse 20 says, For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. You were free from all and every type of obedience, which the example of Enoch tells us about. You could perform nothing that was pleasing to God. But Hebrews 11.5 says that Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. Which brings us to Romans 6.22. So we've gone from verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. And then in verse 20 it says, When ye were the servants of sin, you were free from all types of righteousness. You could not perform righteousness. You could not obey. You could not please God. And then in verse 22 it says, But now, there's the gospel, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And so we see that the progression of Abel to Enoch is from one form of servitude 
Abel previously being in Adam. You see that? The progression from Abel to Enoch is from one servitude. Abel having seen his previous servitude to the devil from one form of servitude to another form of servitude. And our Lord himself told us in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. And then we have Luke. Let's look at Luke 1. Beginning with verse 74. That he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And so we see the progression from Abel to Enoch. And we have spent a lot of time on this because of this monster heresy of antinomianism which is growing by leaps and bounds as we speak. And then last week we emphasized the importance of the covenant in the person of Noah, as you recall, he prepared an ark to the saving, not of individuals, but to the saving of his house. God does save individuals, but his salvation is not individualistic, but covenantal, as the case of Noah tells us. God saved Israel out of Egypt. So were all the Israelites saved? Of course not. Well, then why doesn't it simply say that God saved many individuals out of Egypt? And the answer is that God's salvation is not individualistic, but covenantal. Back to the instance of Paul and the Philippian jailer we mentioned last week. You either have Paul being given omniscience when he said, believe on the Lord Jesus, he said to the jailer, when the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? You either have Paul being given omniscience is that possible? When his answer to the Philippian jailer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and now not only will you be saved, but your entire household. Or, either he was given omniscience, or, and I see this as the only real possibility, since God doesn't ever give any man omniscience. He was saying to the Philippian jailer, thou shalt be saved, and thy house, meaning that there will be Household salvation, covenantal salvation. And lastly, before we get to the rest of the message, we just said that Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his house. And I asked you how many people were in the church at the time, and many scholars have estimated, have you ever thought of this? I can't remember if we've mentioned this before. At the time... Of Noah, some scholars have said that there were almost as many people on the earth as there are now. And yet, how many people were in the church? There were only eight. So we see that the home, which was Noah's family, preparing an ark to the saving of his house, was the church. And so it is today. The home is a microcosm of the church. Lastly, we spent the majority of our time last week in explaining the significance of Noah in this progression, as we see, of salvation, progression from Abel to Enoch to Noah, and then lastly, when we get to verse 17, to Abraham. I thought that we would be proceeding forward this week with verse 17, but I saw something that made me change my mind. And that is, I saw something that ties this passage even clear, more clearly, in my mind, to our original text. I saw something that ties it more closely than what I had seen before. So let's go back to our original text in Isaiah 52, 7. If you look up on Sermon Audio, it says this is a series from Isaiah 52, 7, which says, Now how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Good tidings meaning the gospel. That publisheth peace. That bringeth good tidings of good. That publisheth salvation. That saith unto Zion, This is the gospel. This is what we proclaim. 
thy God reigneth. So, um, as we are wont to do, we want to see how we got where we are in Hebrews 11 from Isaiah 52, 7 and try to see yet another key link between the two passages, between Isaiah 52, 7 and Hebrews 11, which is the faith chapter. Remember we said at the time that Isaiah 52, 7 is the gospel in three words. Die, God, reigneth. We also said that this passage corresponds to a parallel passage in Psalm 96, 10, which says, Say unto the heathen, the Lord reigneth. So we have in both instances the gospel in three words. Thy God reigneth, the Lord reigneth. The gospel is justification by faith. We've emphasized frequently that when a person becomes a Christian, he looks, this is, I remember this so clearly after I became a Christian. You read the Bible looking for the gospel. You just end up doing that. The gospel is so precious to you. And the gospel is justification by faith, which says, how, which is an answer to the most important religious question, how then can a man be just? How can a man be just with God? Be justified in God's sight. It is through faith. How is that related to Isaiah 52, 7? The Lord reigns by his law, causing you to see your need to be justified. And through the faith which the Holy Spirit works in you, Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to you, and now you can stand, you can see, and you are justified in the sight of God. Justification of the gospel is tulip. T is the problem. Totally depraved and wanted some man see how can a man be just with God? He asks that question. He sees that his only hope because of his total depravity is a salvation from without himself rather than from within himself which is, which is the essence of unconditional election. And so that this salvation will be consistent with God's justice. Christ is sent to make it consistent with his justice. And yet when we're born in space and time, we have nothing to do with the righteousness which Christ worked out on our behalf. And so the Holy Spirit in irresistible grace, T-U-L-I, unites us in working faith in us, unites us to the righteousness of Christ which is impudent. You see how that's the same exact thing as justification by faith. And then the P is the result of the gospel. We said that the gospel is also, as we've been speaking of in our Bible study on Friday's Your Time, the gospel is Christ executing the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king. Prophet. Tells us of our depravity in God's election. Priest, Christ making God's salvation consistent with his justice. And king, in irresistible grace, subduing us to himself. No thanks to us. And ruling and defending us. And perseverance of the saints. And then... Our working definition of the gospel is found in Romans 3.26 that he might be, once again, justification by faith. Tula, prophet, priest, and king. An explication as to how God can be just, how God can receive sinners unto himself and not violate his justice, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And we saw here, we we saw here that the gospel also, we're speaking now of Isaiah 52, 7. The gospel also is in these three words. Do you see the relationship of these three words to what we have said above? As to what the gospel is. The Lord reigneth. We said that God's scepter is his law. How does he reign? He reigns through his law. And what did we say that faith is? 
since Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter and we're seeking to explain what these two passages, what ties these two passages together, Isaiah 52, 7 and the chapter of Hebrews 11. What is, what is faith? How does faith come in? Faith is the gas, we've said, that runs the machinery. We said that when Adam fell, he fell into a state of sin. Where it consists the sinfulness of that estate where the man fell. The, cons- the sinfulness of that estate where the man fell consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin. The one of original righteousness and the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin. Together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. Adam fell into a state of sin. Faith sees this. We said faith runs the machinery or we could say from a, from a different angle. Faith is the eye of the soul. Faith sees all this. Faith takes all this in. Faith tells you that when Adam fell, he fell into two states of sin. We pointed this out in Isaiah 52, 7. We're reviewing now, as you see. He fell into an objective state of the guilt of sin, faith tells us. And he fell into a subjective state of being under the dominion of sin. The guilt of sin, objectively speaking. Man is guilty. Remember what we said last week about legalism and antinomianism, our two greatest enemies. We said that an understanding of Abel, which is faith, an understanding of Abel delivers us from the skilla of legalism. The skilla in Charybdis, remember that? Uh, between the devil and a deep blue sea, between a rock and a hard place. The skilla of legalism, Abel delivers us from that. And we said that the understanding of Enoch delivers us, the understanding of Abel delivers us from legalism. And the understanding of the person of Enoch delivers us from the Charybdis of antinomianism. So let's look at this more closely, especially as it relates to Isaiah 52, 7. The Lord reigneth, and God's scepter is his law, as we just said. First of all, God's ruling by his law, meaning he he insists on his law, causes us to see. Once again, faith runs the machinery. His ruling by his law causes us to see our objective state of guilt. A person could feel better than anyone has ever felt on earth. A person could live to be 110 years old and feel every single day of his life better than any other person that's ever felt on the earth. And yet he could be completely guilty Because guilt has nothing whatsoever to do with feelings, as we're pointing out. Adam fell into an objective state of guilt, liability to punishment. Remember what we said about Cain. Cain and Abel. We said that Abel's offering was accepted. Cain's offering was objected, was rejected. But we also said that that Cain's offering offering was rejected not primarily but because of anything about his offering or how he offered it or what he offered Abel's offering excuse me Cain's offering was rejected because Cain himself was rejected and this is what no false gospel like sees they don't see it because he has no faith The false gospelite and faith, as we said, runs the machinery, causes us to see these things. And get this, Abel saw it. He saw that the wages of sin is death. Every act I ever performed, Abel saw. Every act I ever performed was sinful because in the words of Chrysostom, which we just quoted Man himself, man not only has a sinful nature, but he has himself wholly sinned. Abel saw that. 
He saw that God could not accept him because of him. And that was the basis of, it, of his acceptance. Let me say that again. Abel saw that the reason God could not accept him was because of him. And that was the basis of his acceptance. You see that? No false gospel like could ever understand that. The basis of God's accepting him was his realization that God could not accept him because of him, not because of anything he did. Because this realization drives him from himself to Christ. Do you see that? You have to see that. God cannot accept me. The reason he doesn't accept me has nothing whatsoever to do with anything I've ever done. The reason God cannot accept me is because of me. And that realization drives me by the grace of God to Christ's perfect righteousness. Abel understood that I deserve to die not because of anything I've done, but because of everything. Because that everything I've ever done is a manifestation of who I am. Adam, we said, fell into an objective state of the guilt of sin. And Abel, through faith, saw that. What did we say before? Remember this statement? The person and work of Christ. I have a book behind me on the bookshelf entitled The Person and Work of Christ. The person and work of Christ is necessitated by not only the work of the sinner. That's what everybody says, right? Both true gospel and false gospel. The wages of sin is death, they tell us. Yes, and what are they saying by that? That a person goes to hell because he's committed sins, which is true. But that's not the main reason. The person and work of Christ is necessitated by the person of the sinner, what the, who the sinner is before he's ever committed a single act. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. They're going astray as a manifestation of who they are by nature. God's law, being his scepter, as we just said, the Lord reigneth, drives us to complete despair. And this is, a, this is an objective despair. Meaning what? Meaning I'm guilty no matter how I feel. Some people call this bad news. But it's good news. Number one, why is this good news? The realization, somebody said, you've got to tell the bad news before you can tell them the good news. No, 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 it's all good news. The fact that you are something other than what, the realization, get this, the realization of the fact that you are something other than what God demands you to be is good news. Number one, because truth is always good news. Number two, it's good news because total despair of yourself is your only hope. Say that again. Total and complete despair of anything in you that could recommend you to God is your only hope, which is what Abel discovered in his sacrifice. And so Abel was accepted by God because God accepted him in the sacrifice, which his sacrifice foreshadowed the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what the old Puritans said about the prodigal son in making this same point. That if you see anything in yourself which is in any way, shape, or form acceptable to God, you have not, you do not, you will not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Puritan said about the prodigal son that the, the prodigal son will never return to the father's love as long as he has pig's food to eat. You must be driven from your pig's food. And how does God deliver us from this state, from this objective state of guilt? The answer is 
through propitiation. Hearing his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And now we can stand objectively speaking in the presence of God. The ungodly shall not stand in the day of judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. He delivers us from this state of guilt through propitiation. Christ is our objective sacrifice for sin. Your sin must be punished. And it was punished in the person of Christ. And this objective solution is called justification. You see how beautiful that is. Which means just as if God views you objectively just as if you never sinned. Justification. So we said that the first thing that God's reigning by his law causes us to see the elect sinner is his objective state of guilt. And this is the revelation of Abel. God caused Abel to see in his sacrifice. His sacrifice tells us, caused him to see his objective state of guilt before God. God's reigning by his law caused him to see that. Secondly, God's reigning by his law in Isaiah 52, 7, the Lord reigneth. Not only shows us our objective guilt and deliverance in Christ, but also shows us our subjective state that Adam fell into. Remember we just said he fell into an objective state of guilt? He also fell into a subjective state of the dominion of sin. Guilt is objective. You're guilty no matter how you feel. You're damned no matter how you feel. No matter what you do. And then a subjective state of the dominion of sin. Remember we said that Augustine... In pointing out man's relationship to sin, before the fall, man was able to sin. After the fall, he, was, he fell into a state of the dominion of sin, meaning unable not to sin. Sin has its reign over you. And this was Enoch's, this is, this is what Enoch tells us. The revelation of Enoch, revelation of Abel. Objective state of sin, unable, uh, uh, falling, falling into the, the guilt of sin. Enoch tells us of our subjective state of the dominion of sin, unable not to sin. Stated in another way, God's reigning by his law causes you to see that you can't be a subject of the king. That's Abel. Secondly, God's reigning by his law causes you to become a subject of the king. Let's, let, let, me, let me correct that. that. That is still Enoch. God's reigning by his law, first of all, causes you to see that you cannot, you cannot do anything but sin. You cannot, unable not to sin. Enoch tells us this. Enoch who walked with God. You cannot be a subject of the king. And then secondly, God's reigning by his law causes you to become a subject of the king. How glorious. That's Enoch. You see it. Adam and all his descendants fell into an objective state of the guilt of sin. And God delivers his people through propitiation, which we just call justification. That's Abel. Secondly, Adam and all his descendants fell into a subjective state of the dominion of sin. We in our actions cannot but sin by nature. And we are delivered through what is called regeneration. Objective state of sin delivered by Christ's propitiation of the wrath of God. Subjective state of sin, we are delivered. 
Our deliverance is called regeneration. Now we are able to be subjects of the king, subjectively speaking. And regeneration is an initiation of the process called sanctification. You see how this, this is a, the, the, the essence of what Enoch tells us. Enoch walked with God. Enoch was sanctified. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to, subjectively speaking, to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. That's Enoch's revelation. Enoch walked with God, which is called sanctification. Conclusion. Isaiah 52, 7 and Psalm 96, 10, which says, The Lord reigneth. Abel's sacrifice shows God's insistence on the Decalogue and our resulting need for justification. He brings us to total despair, which is our, which means our only hope is in Christ. Secondly, Enoch's walking with God shows that God's reigning by his law makes us subjectively something that we were not and could not be. Sanctification. Dying more and more into sin and living more and more into righteousness. And the final stage of this is called glorification. But before we get there, what does the text do? It takes us to Noah. We can't leave that out. We deal with Abel, guilt of sin, and justification being the solution. We deal with Enoch, dominion of sin, regeneration, and sanctification, delivering us from the dominion of sin. But the text takes us to Noah. And what's the signification of that? Matthew 16, 18. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter. Christ says to Peter after Peter says, when Christ poses the question, whom do men say that I am? And he says, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Noah's example. The text takes us to Noah. Tells us that God's church, where was the church in the days of Noah? Eight people. It was his family. It was his house. Noah's example tells us that God's church will not be built individualistically the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. God's church will not be built individualistically, but covenantally. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Question, is Paul calling all children of believing parents, or even at least one believing parent in a household, is he calling them all Christians? Is he saying that either they will be, either they're Christians now or they shall be, become Christians? No. All you'd have to do is find one individual, one child of a believing parent in any household that's ever existed who ended up not believing the gospel. And you've overthrown that idea. He wasn't saying that. He was saying that in some sense, your children are holy. 
They are holy not in an individual sense. They're holy in a covenantal sense. It can only mean that. Hebrews 10, same idea. Hebrews 10. If your child is holy, how can you treat him as unholy? Hebrews 10, 28. Through faith. Uh, excuse me. And then chapter 11. Hebrews 10, 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. We're speaking of Noah's rev revelation here. He prepared an ark to the saving of his house. God's salvation is covenantal. He saves his people primarily in the line of continued generations. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore, sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot, hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. He has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. These men are going to hell. Take it a step further from 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Not only were these people not saved, they ended up going to hell. And yet they were sanctified. Sanctified persons who go to hell. Yes. That's the teaching of Scripture. Because it is not individuals. It is the church. It is households that are sanctified. Paul said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and all thy house. And he, and then it says, he baptized every single person in the house to which the Baptists say. Well, it doesn't say there were any infants in the house. Oh, wow. It doesn't have to. Well, let me ask you this question. If you are a Baptist and believe in individualistic salvation, that God saves people primarily individualistically, of course, we all believe that God saves individuals. The question is, is salvation covenantal or is it individualistic? So I'm going to ask this other question. Since Paul baptized every single one of the jailer's children, were they able to give a credible profession of faith in two hours? These heathen? Is it possible? Is it conceivable? No, it isn't conceivable. Yet he baptized every single one of them without a credible profession of faith. God's salvation is covenantal. Finally, so we go from Abel, which is guilt of sin, deliverance through propitiation and therefore justification. We go from Abel to Enoch, which is dominion of sin. We're delivered and caused as God caused Enoch to walk with God. He overcomes. Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us unto himself. That's Enoch. And ruling and defending us. That's the third stage in Augustine's statement of the relationship of man to sin. First of all, Adam was able to sin when he felt unable not to sin, dominion of sin. Thirdly, in salvation, able not to sin. That's Enoch. Did you see online I put that up? Able. A-B-E-L. Able to be justified. And I put... Enough, E-N-O-C-H-G-H, -H. Enoch, Enoch, enough to be sanctified. 
able to be justified. Abel tells us that through Christ, through Christ's propitiation, though we were under the guilt of sin, I'm able to be justified through Christ. I am enough in Christ, E-N-O-C-H-G-H, -H, to be sanctified. But you got to go through Noah. And then finally, we get to verse 17. What happens after that? In the household. Two individuals in the household. Individual elect people. What happens to us? We're constantly. Verse 17. Through faith, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried. We're constantly tried and tested, not so that God can see what the strength of your faith is, but so that you can see the weakness of your faith and the need that it be strengthened and that it is only strengthened by the word and the spirit, the word being the word which always relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.